Um, we've been invited uh, by Tina to come and uh, uh, present some of our work on mobile learning. By we, I mean the London Mobile Learning Group, which is an interdisciplinary international group of uh, researchers and practitioners. A number uh, of the members of the group are here and uh, will be talking uh, with you uh, over the course of uh, this afternoon. So I'm not going to introduce them all now because they'll be introducing themselves uh, later on. Uh, what I thought I'd do to start off with uh, is um, in the next half an hour or so present some of the uh, context against which uh, we've been uh, working on the implementation uh, of mobile technologies uh, in classrooms and seminar rooms, um, in secondary schools and higher education uh, institutions uh, in this country and uh, in other countries as well as to some extent uh, in uh, primary schools. And uh, we continue to work on uh, various aspects. Hopefully after this session uh, we'll be having meetings with representatives uh, from uh, schools uh, to see uh, how we can extend our reach uh, into schools. But at this point in time um, we'd like to present what we've done to date and maybe we'll get on to uh, looking at some of the uh, future activities uh, as well. Now, uh, if you want to find out about uh, who we are and what we've been doing, I suggest you just go to our website. I'm not going to bore you uh, with, with the details uh, here. Uh, suffice it to note that uh, what we're trying to do is find a way of getting theory and practice to uh, interact uh, with each other uh, in a meaningful way. And by meaningful, I mean in a way that actually benefits uh, young people and children uh, in their uh, endeavors. Um, and uh, as Tina has said, uh, we've done quite a bit of work uh, in this field, which uh, we are hoping to condense uh, in about uh, the, the, the next two hours or so. Um, there is um, some case studies that we've collected uh, of the use of mobile technologies in classrooms, in work-based context. We've thought about uh, issues of research in mobile learning. We've developed our own uh, theory uh, of uh, mobile learning and uh, we've uh, tried to engage an international audience through editing special issues of journals and so forth. Uh, we've tried to output uh, our work in uh, traditional form uh, books but also in open source journals so uh, if you are interested and you look at our website you'll be able to get uh, to some of the uh, papers uh, in open access journals. And we've also here tried to produce some material that can be downloaded from our websites for teachers, which uh, tries to translate some of our work. So feel free to go and uh, download some of the stuff. Now, one of the questions, obviously, that uh, poses itself is uh, why we should actually bother looking at uh, mobile devices as potential tools for learning. And uh, to be absolutely upfront with you from the start, uh, it's not really uh, so much the technology that interests us, but it is the learning that we are interested in. And in particular, we're interested in the uh, social and cultural practices of uh, young people in their life worlds, in their everyday uh, life and how those can uh, best interface with uh, what they're expected uh, to be doing at school and what they need to be doing at school in order to be doing well uh, at school. So it's this uh, interface between the naive expertise, if you want to call it like that, that young people develop in their engagement with technologies in their everyday lives uh, and uh, what school expects of them that's of interest. And uh, if you just uh, thought about, for a minute, about the sorts of things that you do uh, with those mobile devices, you'd probably come up with a list like this. Um, these are the sorts of things you would do. And uh, if you wanted to look at it more empirically, uh, you would find studies uh, on the internet which show that uh, this is uh, what uh, people do 
uh, daily with their phones and that's not just people in uh, developed uh, Western countries but that's people all over the world. Um, you can see here that clearly making calls uh, is, is important but uh, browsing the web uh, listening to music, using mobile internet, engaging in social networks, uh, score all score above 50% uh, here on this particular uh, scale. So um, it's, I think, fair to say that these technologies have become uh, pervasive in uh, everyday life um, and that therefore it's difficult for schools to ignore them I mean, there's various, various ways in which you can respond to them. Unfortunately, from our point of view, at this point in time, the most uh, prevailing uh, response uh, is that of banning uh, them uh, from the school premises. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, not particularly helpful because it doesn't allow uh, for the affordances that uh, these devices and associated technologies have for learning. Uh, to be actually harnessed. What do people uh, who have got telephones uh, miss most? Uh, make video calls. So there seem to be, you can see that it's only by comparison with the other figures, 22% of people who miss that. But uh, uh, it, it seems therefore that uh, many, either that, that many phones have actually the technical uh, facilities. Uh, to, to offer the sorts of things that people want to do most because this sort of list, if you look at it, uh, is sort of fairly uh, specialist types of uh, applications. Now, uh, if you wanted uh, to look at it more from a, a, a learning perspective rather than a functionality perspective, um, you might come up uh, with, with a list of, uh, with, with, with a, um, a set of uh, features uh, like this. Um, contextualized learning, reporting, presentation, transcription, on-demand access, simulation, translation. So there's a whole vast range of uh, types of things uh, that are clearly learning related that these devices uh, allow you to do. So what is new and what is different with those devices and one of the questions that uh, when we started uh, out in our work with mobile technologies in around 2007 that we wanted to ask ourselves was what constitutes a mobile device? Uh, is it a telephone or do things like uh, laptop computers count as mobile devices as well? What for us has been very important in our work is actually the, uh, uh, the aspect of uh, personal ownership, ubiquity, um, pervasiveness and that's why we have tended to focus very much on telephones uh, rather than other portable devices. But given what's been happening in the last few years around tablet computers in particular, we are increasingly of the view that we're needing to look at these as well and that's what we're starting to do uh, now uh, in, in, in our current work. Um, but the main point here, the first point I have made around uh, the increasing embeddedness in our life worlds of these technologies, um, the second point I haven't really made as, as uh, uh, starkly as it's put there in the bullet, which is there is, uh, we believe, a danger of a failure of keeping pace with these developments in users' life worlds um, and therefore there's a potential disconnect between the, what users do in everyday life and uh, how uh, educational institutions go about uh, their practices. Um, and um, that, uh, we do think, uh, is, is an issue that needs to be addressed. Now, we speaking here under the banner of um, achievement for all and uh, one of the reasons why we thought uh, we were uh, suitably qualified to come and uh, run a session here was not only because our sort of historic involvement uh, with, with colleagues in uh, MirandaNet and uh, the um, development of the format uh, of session that we're witnessing here today, the Miranda Mods, which uh, 
uh, I think we support it uh, in, in developing. But our work focuses on what we call uh, at-risk learners. And I just thought I'd spend a couple of minutes explaining what we mean by at-risk learners. Um, we, and uh, Ben Bachmeier, who will be speaking uh, in, in a little while, uh, did a very detailed uh, analysis um, on the basis of statistical uh, data about media practices uh, of uh, young people that's been published in Germany uh, of uh, the importance of uh, a social milieu um, in, in relation to people's media practices and um, people from, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail here about what social milieus there are, suffice it to say that different uh, social milieus have different disposition uh, and attitudes uh, towards the use of technology and in particular attitudes uh, towards risk and uh, as we know uh, the use of mobile devices uh, carries uh, potential risks and therefore uh, in particular uh, young boys from uh, lower socioeconomic uh, groupings uh, are at a particular uh, risk uh, because uh, of their attitude towards uh, uh, risk uh, taking. Um, and, um, and other characteristics, of course, uh, they tend to have is a certain distance uh, to school and the ways in which schools go about uh, the, 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 the processes of teaching and learning. And they therefore uh, have some difficulties uh, to access and benefit uh, from the resources that society has to offer um, and um, these resources are becoming increasingly uh, important uh, in being able to live successful uh, lives uh, in our increasingly individualized life world. So by that we simply mean that um, Traditionally, or traditional institutions of uh, society are withdrawing more and more and increasingly putting the onus on the individual to make choices and make decisions about what they do and how they do uh, things and um, their uh, school and, and, and other institutions are, are less able and less willing to, to, to guide uh, these uh, choices. Um, new media are becoming increasingly important in uh, the process of making these choices and uh, traditional literacy continues to be very important in enabling uh, young people to make these choices. To give you a very simple example, I'm sure uh, most of you uh, have engaged in uh, the practice of downloading a piece of software uh, from the internet or uh, subscribing to a particular uh, internet-based service. Uh, let's say set up a, uh, without wanting to advertise any particular companies now, but um, say, you know, setting up a Google uh, email account. And at some point uh, you will be asked to agree to a certain set of uh, conditions. Um, have you actually read these conditions? Do you know what you've agreed to? And if you've tried to read it, you will have found, and I've done that once, I can't remember what it was with Google or some other service, to actually copy and paste that uh, agreement into a Word document. And I was staggered to find that it ran to an amazing 17 pages of dense legalistic uh, text. And I can't say now whether that's the case for this particular thing because I didn't reread it coming into this session here now. But uh, one of the things you're very likely uh, to have done there is made all sorts of decisions about what happens to personal information of yours uh, in the process of that and so forth. Yeah? So that's what, what I mean uh, around uh, when I refer to uh, dispositions towards risk, attitudes towards risk and by implication uh, young people, and not so young people, putting themselves at risk uh, in, in relation to what these technologies have afforded and the importance uh, of, of literacy. And I just about you know, managed to understand all, all the legalese, uh, but uh, 
on, on some points, so you actually need a lawyer, uh, legal advice, in order to understand the full implications of what's going on, because these things have been sometimes uh, written in a way that, 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 that could be uh, uh, open to interpretation. So that's what we mean there. So in, in a sense, this affects everybody, this, this, this notion of, 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 of risk. But um, in particular, uh, it, it, it affects one group, one social media, and, and one particular group uh, within particular social media is uh, very hard, and those tend to be uh, young boys uh, from uh, migration uh, backgrounds uh, who uh, tend to perform uh, in sort of bottom 25% when it comes to international comparisons such as PISA and, 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 and so forth. Uh, and they are clearly affected by a misalignment uh, of what uh, school-based literacy uh, is, is all about um, and uh, the personal uh, literacy or literacies and media practices that they engage in uh, in their everyday lives. And uh, so that's maybe not the exact 100% fit that some of you uh, might uh, be, be looking for in, in, in relation to achievement for all. So we're not looking specifically at pupils with uh, learning difficulties, special education needs, but we're looking at young people uh, who uh, face challenges in relation to literacy practices uh, of the sorts that uh, I've just mentioned here. So what is happening to literacy? Let's, let's uh, ponder a little bit on that since it's going to be, uh, I think, central to some of the presentations that we'll hear later on because quite a bit of the work that we've done going into uh, schools, going into uh, further education colleges and working uh, with uh, at-risk learners there uh, focuses uh, on, on literacy. Well, literacy you might uh, interpret as the cultural or define as the cultural techniques involved in reading and producing artifacts to make sense of and shape the socio-cultural world around us. And um, the way in which uh, I've uh, worded that uh, will signal to you that uh, we take a much uh, broader view than uh, traditionally uh, people might have done when talking about uh, literacy in relation to uh, uh, reading and, and uh, writing uh, more narrowly, uh, but also uh, the fact that reading and writing have become very different sorts of practices in the context of the social media uh, that uh, we've got at our disposition. So what's happening there? Well, texts are increasingly open instead of fixed. They're subject to constant modifications. Uh, texts uh, comprise different modalities. So we've got images and not just words. We've got sounds. Uh, we've got uh, all sorts of uh, uh, degrees of complexities of interplay between these different uh, modalities. And texts become contextualized and recontextualized according to specific situational requirements. In traditional parlance, that would be called copy and paste. Yeah? So we want to think of it in, in a more positive way in terms of concept, contextualization and recontextualization. So uh, text making in this context needs to be, we argue, understood as uh, semiotic, as cognitive, and as uh, affective. So it's a fairly sort of complex uh, thing. And uh, just to expand on that a little more, uh, if you look at what's happening in the context of uh, text making or text production with mobile phones and mobile devices, even I have started to adopt uh, very strange new habits the other day somebody wanted to give me a, then a telephone number and what did I do? I took a photo of the piece of paper they gave me uh, and that was my way of recording and making a text. Yeah? So it's, and then saving it off in my, um, uh, on my phone and then emailing it to myself and at some point when I was sat on the computer entering into it into my uh, uh, contacts uh, database. So. Um, with these devices, we're starting to develop some very new uh, cultural uh, 
practices and, and literacy practices. So um, there is new um, ways of needing to look at linguistic principles of text production, for example, in relation to economy. Given that uh, not everybody has got, uh, you know, uh, uh, smartphones that do have uh, virtual keyboards that are reasonably easy uh, to, uh, in, in terms of text uh, input, um, it can be quite cumbersome and burdensome uh, to type in text and uh, you'll make a new economy. So you take a photo of it, it's much quicker than actually spending uh, your time writing long messages. You develop new uh, types of conventions uh, such as uh, you know, use of smileys and, and, and those sorts of things. So language changes. Uh, you develop new dispositions towards redundancy and recursivity. Um, there is certain affordances that these uh, devices offer in terms of fostering synthesis, uh, hindrance of uh, prolixity, so you'll find much less waffle because it's just not economic uh, uh, to, to uh, do that. Um, and uh, it fosters rereading and planning because you need to uh, concentrate more, it becomes more difficult on the small screen and all of that. But at the same time, um, and it offers a range of representational sources, resources uh, such as uh, audio recordings, video recordings and so forth. But it's also got uh, challenges as I've alluded to already. And uh, in, in her work, our colleague Elisabetta Adami uh, from Verona in Italy, who can't be here today unfortunately, uh, she's done some very interesting analysis uh, that uh, uh, shows what actually happens uh, to, to mobile text where uh, a success in communication uh, using these devices uh, is having to be uh, uh, redefined. And I'm not going to uh, go into a, a lot of detail here, uh, but just to try and sensitize you to a particular perspective of at risk. Uh, and that I think um, is uh, of relevance uh, to all learners, uh, whether they are classified uh, as uh, belonging to a, a, a particular uh, group of learners with, with, with learning difficulties or not. And it might also be interesting to spend a minute or two uh, on uh, what, what we mean by learning. In our definition, uh, we see learning as a process of coming to know, being able to operate successfully in and across new and ever-changing contexts and uh, learning spaces. So, the real question is not what is learning, but the question is what is not learning? And that's one of the challenges. Uh, Tina asked me earlier, have I got any questions? Uh, and that would be one of the questions yeah, that I would uh, like colleagues to, 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 to think about. What's not learning? So understanding and knowing how to utilize our everyday life worlds as learning spaces process of meaning making through communication, conversation acro across multiple contexts among people through science situated in and distributed across learning activities, augmentation of inner conceptual and outer semiotic resources and not the process of delivery and transmission of content to mobile devices. So one of the things that I would uh, like you to do uh, as you go through the exhibition later on is to think about uh, what um, definitions of learning some of our um, service providers and uh, software engineers and uh, content providers uh, have. Is it about, is mobile learning conceived of as uh, packaging and repackaging of existing uh, content uh, and breaking it up into smaller bits and uh, pushing it out to uh, devices with, with uh, small screens and limited uh, memory uh, or is it actually about uh, enabling, uh, facilitating processes of understanding and utilizing our everyday life worlds uh, for meaning making uh, and communication and conversation. So that's another sort of question uh, I'd like you to ponder and to think about. We are very clear what we mean by learning and that's what we do mean by it. So it's a process of trying to augment your conceptual resources 
And the important thing is that this augmentation is not directly on the world. And anybody who's read Vygotsky, for example, uh, will know that. It's mediated. It's mediated by socio-semiotic tools such as language, but it's also mediated by material artifacts such as technology and such as mobile devices and uh, mobile technology. So the question really is for us to try and understand the potential and the affordances uh, of these technologies uh, in relation to um, our understanding of learning uh, rather than uh, trying to um, take a technology and then desperately looking at ways in which it can be applied to traditional uh, practices uh, of uh, education. So um, what we are saying is that um, learning is uh, socioculturally bound and contingent in terms of time, in terms of location, in terms of co-learners, in terms of pedagogical approaches, technical means. And we're also saying that because mobile devices have a particular range of uh, affordances and functionalities, they are actually able to allow us to cross these boundaries uh, and uh, work in and across uh, contexts of time, contexts of location, contexts of co-learners. And this seminar here is uh, an example in that there might be, I don't know, 25 people in the room, I didn't count them, uh, but uh, surely somebody could tell us how many people are online uh, watching and uh, contributing. So this ability of uh, crossing uh, context, not having to make do with the uh, restraints and constraints of uh, the physical location within one uh, operates and its resources, but broadening that out. So in a sense, therefore, uh, what the mobile technologies afford us are cultural resources and traditionally education has been about working with cultural resources but traditionally cultural resources have looked rather different to, to now and uh, that's I think a, a, a shift in mindset that we still need to make in the world of education um, to, to embrace that notion. And the other thing that's very important for our work is this notion of personal definitions of relevance. Um, and uh, everybody who's, who has stood, as I have, in front of uh, groups of uh, demotivated learners will know that being able to access uh, these uh, personal definitions of relevance in relation to the curriculum, in relation to the uh, uh, learning uh, uh, outcomes that, that are being uh, um, uh, focused on and so forth uh, is quite important and increasingly this happens through a process of individual appropriation. If you want to find out more about that, uh, more than welcome to, to, to read up on it. We've written quite extensively about it. So in summary then, our model looks like this. It comprises structures, agency and cultural practices and what we're saying is if you want to be able to understand mobile learning you might use a model like this and an analytical uh, a frame like this and that will allow you to uh, understand what's going on. Structures are clearly important uh, uh, and normally and in a context like this you'd think of structures uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, hardware, software and all those sorts of things and that's clearly one important th th dimension of structures. But as we've said before, I think it's also very important to understand uh, social milieus, for example, as very important uh, structures and what's happening to uh, a society in relation to the increasing fragmentation, increasing provisionality, uh, increasing discontinuity. Uh, just to give a, a very sort of simple ans uh, e example again uh, from our everyday life worlds, um, watching television for many of you and therefore participating in sort of a mainstream activity uh, in everyday life, uh, certainly since uh, iPlayer has, has uh, been around, isn't what it used to be. Yeah? It's not anymore somebody 
uh, somewhere in a white city making decisions for you what you can see and when you can see it and but it's you having to make decisions about where to find what you want to see how you want to access it and so forth so there's a, a very very significant shift uh, in in um, um, the way uh, structures uh, work and it's increasingly important for the individual to make be able to understand what resources are available where they are available how to get hold of them and make decisions about their suitability or otherwise uh, in, in, in relation uh, to learning one day they're here the next day they're gone that's an aspect of provisionality uh, and uh, this continuity of course refers to things like traditionally uh, school-based learning has been quite uh, significantly influenced by things like textbooks and textbooks tend to have one particular feature that's quite characteristics of uh, book-based uh, 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 cultural resources and that's a degree of linearity yeah? um, so you can say today page 18 exercise 2 in this context of mobile devices and discontinuity this doesn't work anymore because resources are distributed everywhere in the world they're not physically visible they're in, an in, in, in a cloud yeah, where you don't know where the beginning is or where the end and from a teaching point of view you don't know how to get again to where you've been last time if you happen to go away because the bell rings and then uh, you go back a week later to the same class and so these sorts of things yeah, these are all structures and they're important um, cultural practices uh, we define as the routines users engage in uh, in their everyday lives uh, and here in particular and we'll come I'm, I'm just setting the scene here and we have loads of examples later on from practice in schools that my two colleagues John and Ben will introduce to you where they'll use some of these uh, ideas and uh, try and uh, explore and uh, explain uh, uh, learning practices uh, in classrooms with reference to these uh, ideas. Self-expression is extremely important um, and I'd here just like to refer to things like uh, online video repositories like YouTube. What drives YouTube is a seemingly insatiable desire by young and not so young people to represent themselves in some way uh, to, 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 to a larger group. So we need to understand these practices uh, in, in order to be able to uh, make them uh, useful for learning. And of course this notion of user-generated content, I gave some examples already in terms of you know, taking pictures and, and all of that, but also in our work the notion of user-generated contexts, so that we say, yes we might be located in this particular place, but I can actually make my Sunday afternoon uh, a walk with the children in the woods or in the park, a learning experience by using the affordances the mobile telephone provides me uh, and um, accessing information that I might not otherwise have uh, at the ready uh, to explain why things are the way they are and, and, and so forth. Uh, and that of course uh, requires a certain uh, a sense uh, of uh, agency, a, a sense of capacity uh, to act on the world and traditionally uh, media have tended not to necessarily engender that uh, in its users uh, you know transmission based uh, push uh, type arrangements um, where uh, you know words like couch potatoes and so forth I'm sure you, you, you've, you've heard and come across where uh, you know it's what, what is being required here is something rather different is a desire to want to make meaning to uh, use one's uh, expertise to appropriate these cultural resources and we tried to uh, put this uh, in um, capture this by, by, by coining the term a new habitus of learning and uh, this here is uh, the uh, now six-year-old, uh, my six-year-old uh, uh, grandchild, uh, who you might say is messing about with my iPhone. But if you actually start to analyze what's going on is he is learning, he's making meaning of the environment around him 
uh, the world in which he lives uh, using uh, these resources. So uh, he has a purposive uh, uh, engagement with these resources. He sees his life world framed as a challenge, as an environment, and as a potential resource for learning by using the functionality of the device to capture images, for example, coming to me and asking me about it, or using the internet uh, to uh, access information. Now, for this uh, six-year-old, uh, his particular understanding of personal relevance doesn't really match mine. I might go and Google uh, what uh, somebody else has said about the term appropriation before I go and write my own stuff. What he is likely to be more interested in is what shortcut he can find uh, online to actually uh, do better in some sort of uh, Mario Wii Kart game or, or, or something like that. Yeah? So, but uh, provided, but, but he, he, he does have um, a, a desire to learn, albeit the things he wants to learn about are not necessarily the things that I might uh, want him uh, to learn about. And the tension there is how can these uh, things be uh, brought uh, in, in, in line. So uh, the world, so in expertise is individually appropriated. Nobody is going to tell him uh, how to uh, be become better at this particular game. He has to go out and find out about it. And he needs to know where to go and how to go about doing this. So. Uh, I didn't then ask him how he knew that there were various online fora uh, that had this sort of information. And then when I looked, I was absolutely baffled. Pages and pa go screens and screens of very, very dense text, not linear in any, any way, um, very complex really to make sense of, but within seconds he knew exactly what bits of that screen was of relevance to him, took the information, went off again and uh, uh, he was on his merry way and he had learned and he had improved. Um, the world has become the curriculum populated by mobile device users in a constant state of uh, expectancy and contingency. And then interrelationships between target orientation, self-representation and play. And that's something that uh, Ben, I think, uh, is going to talk about uh, in some uh, detail.